Hello, everybody. Big greetings to you all, wherever you are on this beautiful planet. I am back from Andalusia. I'm in Hungary. Uh, it's less, less hot as it was there. We had 45 degrees, which is like, I don't know, I think 110 Fahrenheit. We have a bit less heat, which is around maybe 20, 28 degrees. So just a little recap of what we covered at our first uh, lecture. Hermann Hesse's uh, Siddhartha. Uh, we covered his biography, and I really wanted you to see that how much Hermann Hesse wrote himself in, in his work of Siddhartha, how he left his family, and how he actually went on his way, and how he approached self-realization. So this is what we covered roughly at the first four chapters. And now we're going to go to the, to the last eight chapters. And I will try to really create a very succinct uh, message of mine and message of Hesse, really. And as I said before, I really would like you to share your thoughts with me on this, because obviously this is just my view, and I'm very interested to hear yours. So um, Siddhartha's refusal to follow the Buddha is in keeping with Nietzsche's statement in Thus Speak Zarathustra that said, one repays a teacher badly if one always wants to remain nothing but a pupil. Hermann Hesse is urging Siddhartha to seek his true self and to do, to do so without props. Siddhartha's quest may be seen as a natural outcome of tendencies, influences, and events peculiar to Hesse's own life. Siddhartha infers that Buddha attained self-realization by seeking his own way and listening to his inner voice. When the ferryman takes him across the river, the world of the senses becomes Siddhartha's new playground. Hence, his involvement with the stunningly beautiful and rich courtesan Kamala. One deep kiss from Kamala suffices to launch him on the path of worldly wisdom. The life that is lived here is simple, thought Siddhartha. It has no difficulties. Everything was difficult, irksome, and finally hopeless when I was a Samana. Now everything is easy, as easy as the instruction in kissing which Kamala gives. I require clothes and money, that's all. These are easy goals which do not disturb one's sleep. Siddhartha cannot, however, erase all trace of his past life. It has left its mark so deeply on his soul that he is forced to recognize that, despite all, he is still separated from his fellow beings. In a manner reminiscent of Buddha himself, his heart opens to the suffering of humanity. Aware of the gulf between himself and the common folk, he draws closer to Kamala, he understands him, she understands him better than Govinda ever did. You are the best lover that I have had, she said thoughtfully. You are stronger than others, more supple, more willing. You have learned my art well, Siddhartha. Someday, when I'm older, I will have a child by you. And yet, my dear, you have remained a Samana. You do not really love me. You love nobody. Is that not true? Maybe, said Siddhartha wearily. I am like you. You cannot love either. Otherwise, how could you practice love as an art? Perhaps people like us cannot love. Ordinary people can. That is their secret. In chapter seven, the notion of the outsider surfaces again. Siddhartha begins to feel the discontent which years before had driven him from the home of his parents. 
His inner voice is now silent. Inwardly, he is dead. To compensate, he immerses himself in reckless gambling of which he becomes compulsive, addicted to. Gambling makes him sick of the soul. He suffers from the weariness of living in the world. To make things worse, he notices his first gray hair, Kamala's wrinkles, signs of fading beauty and youth. When he leaves her, he is haunted by fear of old age and of death. One night he dreams, in which he is told that he has thrown away all that was good and value in himself. Dreams in Hesse's novels are, clue, are clues to the state of character soul. Their messages appear as symbols as per Jung and Freud's work, who noted the dreams are via regia to the unconscious. Siddhartha experiences despair. His inner tensions have reached breaking point, and again he leaves home, Kamala, and his job. Kamala decides closing her doors to any clients and finds out that she's pregnant, carrying a child fathered by Siddhartha. Siddhartha wandered into the forest, already far from the town, and knew only one thing, that he could not go back, that the life he had lived for many years was past, tasted, and drained to a degree of nausea. The songbird was dead, its death, which he had dreamed about, was the bird in his own heart. He was deeply entangled in sansara. He had drawn nausea and death to himself from all sides, like a sponge that absorbs water until it is full. He was full of ennui, full of misery, full of death. There was nothing left in the world that could attract him, that could give him pleasure and solace. He wished passionately for oblivion, to be at rest, to be dead. If only a flash of lightning would strike him, if only a tiger would come and eat him, if there were only some wine, some poison that would give him oblivion, that would make him forget, that would make him sleep and never awaken. Was there any kind of filth with which he had not besmirched himself, any sin and folly which he had not committed, any stain upon his soul for which he alone had not been responsible? Was it then still possible to live? Was it possible to take in breath again and again, to breathe out, to feel hunger, to eat again, to sleep again? To lie with women again? Was this cycle not exhausted and finished for him? He falls asleep in the woods to awake anew because the mystical sound of Om arises within him and his moment of crisis passes waking up later spiritually rejuvenated and the change that has taken in him is like a resurrection. The real point of Siddhartha's transformation is that he is a child once again, that he can hear the bird in his breast, that he can relove himself. Moreover, he is quietly convinced that his decision to leave home, Govinda, and the Buddha has been justified, and the root cause of his discontent can be put down to one thing, overexertion. He has spent too long trying to become what he wanted to be, rather than being what he is. Being and becoming now understood by Siddhartha. Siddhartha grew up on the banks of one side of the river, crossed over to the other side to experience the world, and returns to the river in order to stay with it. Each stage lasts approximately 20 years and may be seen to represent the three constituents of a human, the mind, body, and soul. The first four chapters reveal the ascetic ideas of Siddhartha in which he is filled 
with the traditional teachings of his caste. This is followed by his rejection of all practices and disciplines imposed from without, and by his surrender to the glamour of the world based on a carpe diem attitude towards life. This, in turn, leads to self-revulsion and to the third and final stage in his evolution as a seeker on a lonely and arduous spiritual way. As chapter 8 closes, the symbol of the river predominates, closely associated with the syllable OM, a sound that saves Siddhartha from, from destruction. He learns that the river although ever-changing and ever-flowing, always remains the same, is always present. The river simply is. It is not a has-been or a will-be. It is everywhere, itself, simultaneously. Siddhartha realizes that his life too is a river and that all life flows into it. All that exists in its waters, past and future, dissolved in the all-encompassing, eternal, present moment, the sound of which is Om. Chapter 9 starts as it is the river itself, explains the ferryman, Vasudeva, that has drawn Siddhartha, and it is from the river that he will learn how to listen. And then, Enigmatically, he lets slip the comment that Siddhartha will learn the other thing too. What that other thing is Vasudeva will not say. And it is clear to his listener that whatever it is, it cannot be described in words. In time, Siddhartha learns from the river its most treasured secret, that time does not exist. By listening to the river, Siddhartha discovers the truth of unity of all life, the experience of which is the fruit of self-realization, is a law that Buddha lived daily and one that daily contact with the river brings ever closer to Siddhartha. Listening to its eternal flow dispenses with the need for doctrines, rituals and disciplines. Siddhartha, and Vasudeva have no cause to speak. Their hearts and souls are so finely attuned to each other that verbal communication is rendered obsolete. Both have their minds fixed on the eternal. Years pass by and outwardly nothing seems to happen in their lives. They have reached that point where outer events no longer can affect them so permanently linked are they to the one presence in everything. Many describe Hess's novels as landscapes of the soul. We cannot change events, we can only change our reaction to them. This is one of the lessons Siddhartha must learn. The Buddha is close to death. Devotees, including Kamala and her son, rush to receive his last blessings. Kamala is bitten by a deadly snake near the ferry and carried by Vasudeva to his hut, where she is immediately recognized by Siddhartha, who now sees that he has a son. Kamala is dying, and Siddhartha cannot do anything to stop it. Kamala had come to see Buddha's death, but instead is compelled to face her own. In a deeply moving scene, both Kamala and Siddhartha are joined again. She recognizes that Siddhartha is, and yet, is not the same man. Outwardly, he may seem no different, but inwardly, he has been rebaptized. After Kamala dies, Siddhartha has to deal with a son he never knew. The fairy hut is no refuge for a boy accustomed to the good life in the city. And when, after an act of defiance, reminiscent of Hesse himself when at school, the boy runs away 
both, both men realize that it is for the best. Vasudeva explains that everybody born in this world has their own path to tread, a path mapped out in one's karma. In a dialogue, Vasudeva wisely concludes, if you were to die 10 times for him, you would not alter his destiny in the slightest. Siddhartha's newfound human love for his son brings with it no joy but pain. Attempting to win his son's affection only results in greater isolation. Yet he persists, for it is the first time in his life that he has ever been able to love another so completely. When his son leaves, Siddhartha learns an invaluable soul lesson. The son's action reminds us of the time when Siddhartha left home with Govinda to join the ascetics. The pain and anguish suffered then by Siddhartha's parents are what Siddhartha now experiences. He is made to endure what he once caused his own parents to suffer. Through the loss of his son, Siddhartha learns the rare virtue of detachment, a necessary step on the way to wisdom. Chapter 11, Siddhartha learns his final lesson. He listens more attentively to the river and thus is able to reconnect with the past that lives on inside him. He listens and becomes aware of the unity of sound like a cosmic dance. Over and above all else, he hears the healing sound of Om, the same sound that has saved him twice from self-destruction. Ultimately, Siddhartha learns what Vasudeva has known and lived all along. By surrendering to the unity everywhere, inner peace, inner peace may be attained. It is the river's greatest lesson, the one now understood, no matter how fleetingly, by Siddhartha, who witnesses yet another life's farewell, Vasudeva's silent retreat into the forest. Siddhartha says that wisdom is not at all communicable. Knowledge, claims Siddhartha, can be communicated, but not wisdom. Duality that spiritual teachers refer to is a necessary teaching too, but is not the whole picture. In the novel, it takes the form of a mystical vision. Siddhartha's mystical visions are in a sense that they reveal consciousness of the identity of one's own inner being with that of all things. Such mystical experience cannot be communicated. It reaches the limits of philosophy, of language, and most crucially for spiritual aspirants, the end of their striving. Siddhartha points to the unity that can only be truly known in experience and which necessarily transcends all notion of duality. In his discourse on being the sinner, he says the following to Govinda. Listen, my friend, I am a sinner and you are a sinner, but someday the sinner will be Brahma again, will someday attain Nirvana, someday become a Buddha. Now this someday is illusion. It is only a comparison. The sinner is not on the way to a Buddha-like state. He is not evolving, although our thinking cannot conceive things otherwise. No, the potential Buddha already exists in the sinner. His future is already there. The potential hidden Buddha must be recognized in him, in you, in everybody. The word Govinda is not imperfect or slowly evolving along a long path to perfection. No, it is perfect at every moment. Every sin already carries grace within it, 
all small children are potential old men. All sucklings have death within them. All dying people, eternal life. It is not possible for one person to see how far another is on the way. The Buddha exists in the robber and dice player. The robber exists in the Brahmin. During deep meditation, it is possible to dispel time, to see simultaneously all the past, present and future, and then everything is good, everything is perfect, everything is Brahman. Therefore, it seems to me that everything that exists is good, death as well as life, sin as well as holiness, wisdom as well as folly. Everything is necessary. Everything needs only my agreement, my assent, my loving understanding. Then all is well with me and nothing can harm me. I learned through my body and soul that it was necessary for me to sin, that I needed lust, that I had to strive for property and experience nausea and the depth of despair in order to learn not to resist them, in order to learn to love the world and no longer compare it with some kind of desired imaginary world, some imaginary vision of perfection, but to leave it as it is, to love it and be glad to belong to it. And his discourse on the stone we come to the philosophical core of Siddhartha message, which states, this, he said, handling it, is a stone. And within a certain length of time, it will perhaps be soil. And from the soil, it will become plant, animal or man. Previously, I should have said, this stone is just a stone. It has no value. It belongs to the word of Maya. But perhaps, because within the cycle of change, it can also become man and spirit. It is also of importance. That is what I should have thought. But now I think, this stone is stone. It is also animal, God and Buddha. I do not respect and love it because it was one thing and we have become something else. But because it has already long been everything and always is everything. I love it just because it is a stone. Because today and now it appears to me a stone. I see value and meaning in each one of its fine markings and cavities in a yellow, in a gray, in a hardness and the sound of it when I knock it, in a dryness or dampness of its surface. There are stones that feel like oil or soap, that look like leaves or sand, and each one is different and worship Om in its own way. Each one is Brahman. At the same time, it is very much stone oily or soapy, and it is just what pleases me and seems wonderful and worthy of worship. In this love of <clears throat> and for the creation, not for its own sake, but for the sake of, of its creator, it is clear that Siddhartha has come to the same level of experience as his preceptor and spiritual guide Vasudeva. In what is termed his final doctrine, he speaks of the one thing needed of mankind to live in peace and happiness, love. Love for this world, this creation, for others and for oneself. Govinda dismisses Siddhartha's teachings as mere words, however, he acknowledges Siddhartha's saintliness and asks him to give him something to help him on his way. Looking into his face, Siddhartha sees suffering, 
continual seeking and continual failure. He simply asks Govinda to kiss his forehead, an act that enables Govinda to experience Siddhartha's description of the unity of all life. Govinda experiences mystical vision whereby he sees a timeless panorama of humanity performing a myriad of disparate but simultaneously simultaneous actions in which birth and death are seen to be recurrent changes of state. There is no death in what can be best described as an eternal cycle of events. In the context of the novel, it is the mystical experience of unity that matters, which is why the causal flow of time has ceased. All the faces seen are those of Siddhartha, whose blissful smile is exactly the same as that of the Divine Buddha. He is made to experience the truth that wisdom can neither be taught nor communicated in words, and that what he has seen has its source in his own being. Above all else, however, it is the feeling of love which now overwhelms him and which, shown as a smile, closes the text. Not only, therefore, does Siddhartha bestow on his former companion a vision of cosmic unity, but also the experience of universal love, the essence of his doctrine. His smile, no different from that of the illustrious one, has the power to evoke in Govinda the memory of everything that he had ever loved, of everything that had been of value and holy in his life. He has learned the supreme importance of the need to love the world, humanity, oneself, and the need to respond to one's inner voice. Siddhartha reached his mystical heights because he was guided by his heart and always tried to act to the heart, to the inner reality. Not content with words, he felt impelled to touch the inner, truer meaning of life. Siddhartha's experiences taught him to reach out to the heart of a brother, of a group, and finally to the heart of humanity itself. The lives of Siddhartha and Vasudeva show a continual aspiration to increase the consciousness of God within their own being. In concentrating upon the light within, they both come to recognize the perennial teaching that the same light shines in every living soul, even in the animal and the mineral kingdoms, as it does through the etheric worlds. And this makes possible the type of cosmic vision seen by Govinda. He will remember to the last Siddhartha's and Buddha's heavenly smiles, that symbol of a soul that has been liberated from samsara. Instead of restless pressure and effort, the never satisfied and never dying hope that constitutes the life dream of those caught up in the ways of, his, of this lower world, each of us can attain that peace that is beyond understanding, that ocean-like calmness of the spirit, whose mere reflection in the countenance is a complete and certain gospel. Moreover, Govinda learns that wisdom cannot be taught, for what seems right of value and wise to one man often seems nonsense to another. Concluding remarks on Hermann Hesse's Siddhartha. Husse claimed that his novel sought to establish that which was common to all forms of worship and belief. In a strange way, therefore, Hesse, like his parents before him, was a missionary advocating religious unity and brotherhood, but without the need to convert. Siddhartha preaches tolerance, understanding, and patience. 
three much needed virtues to the readers in 1922 and that are still highly relevant today. Most novels of Hesse, especially Siddhartha, was attempting to set down the foundations of a faith that would help young people to begin their lives again. He tried to create, through his writing, a better world and future for all. So why Hesse's Siddhartha is so magical? I believe that what lends reading its ultimate magic is that this vast body of the written word is at once immensely varied and reducible to the simplest, most universal human truth of which Hesse expressed in the following way. The great and mysterious thing about a reading experience is this. The more discriminatingly, the more sensitively, and the more associatively we learn to read, the more clearly we see every thought and every poem in its uniqueness, its individuality, in its precise limitations, and see that all beauty, all charm, depend on this individuality individuality and uniqueness. At the same time, we come to realize ever more clearly how all these hundred thousand voices of nations strive toward the same goals, call upon the same gods by different names, dream the same wishes, suffer the same sorrows. Out of the thousandfold fabric of countless languages and books of several thousand years, in aesthetic instance, there stares at the reader a marvelously noble and transcendent chimera, the countenance of humanity charmed into unity from a thousand contradictory features. This is how I would like to leave it and invite Mark to respond first. George. Georgie, that was just lovely. And you've given us such a profound reading of, um, of Siddhartha that I'm, I'm, I really would like to just sit with it for a while. <laughs> it was beautiful. Um, Georgie and I were talking a little bit before we came on the air about how she, uh, particularly both of us, would really like to hear give plenty of space to the students this time. And so I think one, one question I'd like to raise, and I'll give a little stab at it myself to begin with, for each student is, uh, I think in the spirit of this book, what did you personally get out of this that you feel that you can take into your own life in some way? Um, the book warns us that words don't do it, that there can be the most beautiful words, Govinda tries to follow them, but it doesn't bring him peace, the words themselves, and we, we don't incorporate the truth that way. So oh, we meet these words in this book, but we want to raise the question of, uh, with all of this torrent of, of, of uh, beautiful words and, and even this absolutely wonderful interpretation from Georgie, what can you re, what do you feel that you really incorporate as that you might remember from this in another <clears throat> say? And if I were to raise that question for myself, uh, I, 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 these, these things come to mind. First of all, this kind of truth is available to all of us, even the people with whom we might feel the least sympathy. And we, um, it is, it's in all of us. It's the light that Georgie referred to that's, that's in all of us. And that, uh, but each person has to reach it in his or her own way. And for me as an educator, that's a, 
that's a profound thing to keep in mind. You can uh, feel that you're giving the greatest truth to others, uh, backed by the best possible facts. Um, and it's important to do that. But there is a way in which those truths themselves are highly limited and you never know what by what path other people can best take in uh, to their own experience the, the most profound elements of it. So it, it requires us to be uh, really respectful of the frame of mind of, of every person as an educator that we, that we deal with. Secondly, another, another uh, major thing that I feel is an a, a important component of this book is that for, um, uh, for all of us, or many of us need to experience the world in our own way, no matter, no matter what kind of truths are set in front of us. So Siddhartha meets the Buddha himself and walks away from it because he knows he has to um, take that in for himself. He has to realize it within and the Buddha supports that. And, uh, and, and that his way of realizing it <laughs> requires um, living in samsara. He couldn't mm -hmm. come to his ultimate realization without having done that. Mm -hmm. it, I'm reminded of St. Augustine of uh, talking uh, um, about his wayward youth. And, um, and Augustine, in his Christian way, leaves it behind and more or less condemns his past. But I think it, there are hints in Augustine as well as in, um, and, it's, and it's right on the surface here in this book that um, some of us, by temperament, including Augustine, could not have realized the degree of the divine that they did without having had some experience of the, um, the value as well as the insufficiency of samsara, of, of living, um, of the appeal of the flesh and, of, and also the appeal of riches that drives much of the world. So it's uh, those things are not going away. They have to be mm -hmm. part of, um, of what we are, um, of our means of pursuing the divine truth. And then ultimately, and, and I'll, uh, Georgie, I'll leave it with this thought, the, um, what that ultimate wisdom is, um, maybe few of us are really prepared to articulate in a way that um, is truly valid for others. Mm -hmm. But whatever it is, it has something to do with a sense of, of the interconnectedness of all, all life and all reality. That uh, samsara and nirvana are ultimately one. Each side of the river must be connected by the ferry, ferryman and by the river itself. Um, and that um, it has to do with unity and it has to do with with timelessness, that is to say that change, change we can only accept as part of a greater um, um, reality that lies beyond mm -hmm. the change itself. And that, um, though that's an unsatisfactory formulation for me because I know I'm not there, uh, but it's a, a way of, um, of framing uh, a little bit of a signpost along mm -hmm. the way. So I'm, I'm going to stop with that and, and see if we can raise the question of what, uh, what some of our students and others uh, uh, have for themselves gotten out of this reading and of George's wonderful exposition. Thank you, Mark. But if you allow, I would like to respond to your 
to your wonderful comments. Well, I, I, I'm, I've known you for some time, and this is really the first time that I really feel that your tone of your voice is different than before. I feel that your, your, how you were touched by, by Siddhartha, really. Herman Hesse Siddhartha. And this is how I feel too. But so interesting, I read this book three times, first like 15 years ago, and then I felt differently than I felt when I reread it again just a couple of months ago. And, uh, and what makes a difference is there are two things, uh, which Siddhartha says himself, is that you gain knowledge throughout your life, as well as uh, your own experience of life, really. And these two have to go hand in hand. Without one another, it would be just lopsided as an experience. And also, I, I, how I started my first lecture was really about the magic of reading and what makes a reading so, so magical. Because I think it's another aspect that one needs to really see when reading uh, any Herman Hesse's novels or any other book, uh, in fact. Uh, I really feel that uh, they're not the words per se that really touch, but how you actually relate to the words, really. That's what Herman Hesse said as well. In, 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 in some of his quotes, uh, uh, I cited the, the first time that, that how you actually react to those words really, that you go to that inner world and, and you, you, you have that magical experience that is so subjective. And this is, and this is why I particularly chose certain uh, quotations from the book, that one when he talks about the sensuous, just kiss of Kamala, that how many times we actually feel that that, that kind of like love that other gives is that what makes us happy? And then we go on and we realize that it is actually not the other, not the external what makes us happy. It is within ourselves. Mm -hmm. And only by finding that love to every single thing and being on this planet. So for me, what I take home, uh, there are many things, lots of reminders, constant reminders of really shifting away from the subjective view of the world and life to the more objective, although that's very difficult because I'm myself not a Buddha, but I, I, I work on it, I work on it. But however, I would like to stop because I see that we have our wonderful Jim Garrison joined our call and would like to hear his, his words if possible. And then open the floor to our students. Hello, Georgie. Hi, Mark. Hello, everyone. Um, my question, uh, Georgie, uh, following your splendid uh, two lectures is whether in your judgment, in the end, Siddhartha reached enlightenment. Do you think that his journey got him to what the Buddhists would call enlightenment? I think his own way, yes. I think so. And maybe we need to enter into a different dimension that the, the enlightenment is a very subjective experience, right? We don't know what was exactly Buddha's enlightenment. It was documented by his uh, disciples. What we know is that how Herman Hesse documented his enlightenment, or rather his envisionary enlightenment. So yes, but I would like to turn the table back to you and ask you the same question. How do you feel about Herman Hesse Siddhartha and his enlightenment and his path to enlightenment? Well, I, I think <laughs> this is a, a, a deep issue. In my view, he did not. Oh, okay. In my view, the, the book ultimately um, was more about resignation than enlightenment. And ultimately, there's a feeling tone of pessimism about human possibility based on simply enduring the samsaric realms then there is the enlightenment characterized so profoundly by the Buddha and other um, 
Eastern saints and avatars where one actually detaches from the samsaric realm, like the Buddha leaving the palace, leaving the various ascetic practices, and finally entering into uh, nirvana. So I, I'd love to talk about it more deeply uh, over dinner sometime, but it, in, in, in my view, the, there is a certain resignation to samsara. I don't think the Buddha would agree that it's necessary to experience addictive gambling, compulsive sex, <laughs> um, uh, marital uh, challenges in the way that Siddhartha did, which finally ground him down to resignation. And so when I've read the book, I've always seen it as a cautionary tale of how we squander and waste our time um, rather than embracing um, uh, in a total way what it is that we actually need to do. Yeah, what but then again, Jim, you're talking about knowledge and not about self-experience, and that is what Siddhartha is saying, that you have, you are, you know, he he was a sinner. He had to go through all those depths of ascetism and pain and suffering in order to come out at the end of the tunnel and reach that clarity of enlightenment. I think that I think the path to that is is different to everybody, and that's what Vasudeva was saying yeah. as well. As much as you can do, you cannot stop your son going away. You cannot actually forfeit your past to his or anything. So I think in that in that sense, I would uh, I would I would disagree. I'm not saying that Buddha would say that go through all these horrible things. But then again, Buddha said, yeah, you have to experience, and also you have to doubt my whatever I say. I mean that whatever Buddha said. So that's that's I think that that Siddhartha is such a great case in a sense that going through all the highs and lows. Of a, of a human suffering in order to come to the, to the realization that see beauty and love in every single thing as it is, not as it has been or as it could be. So that's, yeah. what, that's what I love about it. But yes, yes, for the dinner anytime and talk about <laughs> it. <laughs> right, I would like to see which of our students would like to comment, please. Is it, is it Myra or, or Mira? Well, thank you for, uh, you know, the depths in which we've traveled through your conversation and your presentation here. I, um, I have to say what, what I'm taking away is this relationship with nature itself through the river. Nice. Um, it has not been lost on me that, you know, this is a part of his experience that gets um, leapt over all the time in my world as a practitioner. And yet it says to me something similar to the whole idea of, you know, Noah collecting every creepy crawly thing and pears, is that why bother if nature itself were not essential to nirvana, awakening, enlightenment, whatever that might be. And it seems to me when I think about the other question posed about the way in which we find our own um, movement toward greater consciousness. Uh, if I trace the little steps I've taken and the little openings that come, they always seem to be somewhat novel and original and uh, simple and essential. You know, mm -hmm. essence is always there. Uh, in my own life, it's like those things that I thought when I was a very young person that get affirmed and deepen and have advanced are the ones that seem to really hold and, and weather through time. Mm -hmm. Some kind of innate sense, some kind of something that as a little girl, I felt I carried. And I trust that, you know, and the trust in that has grown as I've lived life. Uh, 
but my deepening these days and my the expansion and growth has always come in the most pristine environments and i think that's the key mm. and i feel that if we continue to pollute the environment we block our potential to elevate our view and to see mm. so i that's this story reminded me of of how important it is to literally sit by the river and listen. Thank you. Do you have? Do you live close to a river? Um, I, you know, I was born literally on the ocean, so I oh, consider wow. myself a great ocean girl. And though oftentimes I'm, you know, here and there around the world, and not on my favorite ocean, uh, you know, water is is the place that opens up a lot of space for me mm. so that spaciousness is something i feel that i can contact there's yeah. some intelligence there in water and you know if we go back to really the enlightenment stories of buddha in the older stories uh you know gaia mother earth is the witness and mother earth arises out of the the earth but mm. what she does when she confronts um you know and answers up for uh for, for buddha and confronts mara she takes her hair and twists that hair and a river flows from it you know mm -hmm. and that's where the memory is of all of his walks on life that show his state so it's just um here again, I reflect on the condition of our world, and I, and I think this too is another way of speaking to the interrelated, is the interconnectedness of that which we're embedded in. Uh, we, you know, we, there's a connection here to be recognized. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really beautiful. Thank you for sharing. I do feel that there are lots of symbolisms in the book itself. Of course, the river is one of the, the biggest, really, and almost if we see our own lives, how much we cross from one side to the other, not necessarily as a, as a, as a, as a philosophical or f physiological sense, but we, we kind of like go from one thing to the other and almost kind of like miss what it is in between, which is really ourselves and our inner world. Although I really would, I'm not really comfortable using inner and outer because that, that refers to duality. And to me, it is there is just one really. And it is all in connected, even though its manifestation may be different. But uh, thank you very much. Roderick, would you like to read your poem? I just read that you wrote a poem. <laughs> Fantastic. Please share it with us. Absolutely. First, I just want to thank you for being able to... Um, man take us through this journey and so i mean this is my first time speaking um, in the class and so everyone has been fantastic for me but nonetheless i'll read my poem this was part of my reaction to just going through this journey um is it so can it be a man pregnant Though my physical womb do not bear the characteristics of my counterpart, having the ability to carry and to bear like kind. My womb grows tender, sensitive, varying in degrees of throbbing. Something has come into me. How has the weight of this thing weighed on me? Weight in me so deeply. From my head to my feet, there is a heaviness that seems that rests in me. My focus has become consumed. Oops. How did I get to the open door of my refrigerator? Why am I here? What is it that I hunger for? This thing has consumed me so that my daily cycles have become confused. I look for the tangible, excuse me, I look for the intangibles in tangible places. My thoughts have become so heavy they silence a room. But who else can hear the silence? It's only me present. Is this silence felt by those in whom I come into contact with? My being cross-examines who I am and what I am becoming. 
Do I refute? Do I allow and accept? Am I at liberty to take this decision? I shall sit with, sit in, be present with me, no escape. So that was part of my response, excuse me, um, while listening to the book and going through the book. And I am still having experiences after uh, going through this journey. And so thank you very much yeah, for no, sharing. Thank you. you. Thank you. Well, I think these questions you, you posed in your poem, we all, we all have them. And uh, especially the one word John Doubt for me was silence. Mm. And silence speaks and then mm. can you be heard absolutely because the whole universe is inside of you that's what room yes. is so uh, but you know nobody said it's easy to being a human so but uh, as as Siddhartha said or as rather Hesse said that we are here for for a certain reason or maybe reasons and it is mm. our job to find out what that is just keep going and keep doing and don't lose sight of that wonderful entity that is called nature and the cosmos around us. And then don't get back to this like three dimensional working and money and emotions and so forth. That's why meditation is so important. Or even if you don't see or, or sit next to a river, isn't it great just to look at the sky and yeah. Look at the wonderful clouds going by or at night, see the moon or the stars, just to see that how little and great we are at the same time. Indeed. Thank Indeed. you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Do we have do we have anybody else? I would love to hear some other comments. Come forth, please. Hi Georgie. Great to see uh, you. Thank you for joining. Yeah, yeah. It, it's actually been a delightful talk today, uh, and, and especially uh, both yours and that, the comments be, uh, provided by Mark and Jim, and hello to both of them as well. Um, I'm currently engaged in a two-year study program of contemplative practice, so uh, Siddhartha fits in very nicely with, uh, with the beginning of that journey. Uh, at the moment, I'm uh, reading a lot about the Enneagram, and it's really illustrated to me how different life journey is from person to person. Uh, and if, at least for me, the, the Enneagram is, is a highly accurate description of the, uh, the way in which my life has gone. Um, and as, as you know, I've, I've, I was a psychotherapist for 25 years, uh, assisting people in their own growth. And what stood out for me was uh, the need for both compassion and challenge in life uh, mm -hmm. to move one forward in wisdom. That the mistakes are incredibly valuable in what, ha in what happens in life. And I really underline mistake as a take that missed. Mm -hmm. The mark. The, you know, it's not bad, it's not failure, it's not anything of that nature. It's the challenge for growth. And unfortunately, in my experience, probably, oh, at least two thirds of people that I saw simply wanted to get out of pain. Mm -hmm. They did not want to go beyond the pain into the ultimate seeking of growth. Uh, and sometimes I could, I could, you know, challenge them to do that. And other times uh, it was simply, you know, that of letting them go. Yeah. What I personally take from Siddhartha today is just the, the ultimate acceptance of what is. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, in, in contrast with Jim, for me, Siddhartha did achieve that, that sense of, of enlightenment that um, I don't, have the sense, certainly in my own sense, I don't have the, that sense of resignation, although I have deep sadness at the insanity of our species and, and the way in which we have transformed our planet. And perhaps there will be change, perhaps there will, perhaps there will not be change, and perhaps we will go extinct. But just simply the acceptance that this is what life offers. Um, and, you know, ultimately seeking that joy that passes understanding. 
as you know as the the ultimate experience of life mm. uh, oh the final comment is the um, it's it's a story told in many different ways, but it's, it's the Buddhist story of um, the farmer and the and the wise man, in which um, the the farmer wants something, gets it, finds that there's a difficulty, uh, deals with that, finds a resolution, deals with that, finds a difficulty, in the sense that the the ultimate message is be at peace, come back tomorrow, mm. and mm. deal with what life offers. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Thank you so much. I so agree with every single word you said. It's all, always so wonderful hearing from you. It is, uh, yeah, I, I so agree with you about mistakes. I think mistakes are not mistakes. There and then that is the right decision to be, to be made. And um, mistakes are always, only remain mistakes if we, if we don't correct them in the, in the future or in the present. So, and then just keep trying and keep doing. So uh, that's, that's how the evolutionary curve uh, follows its path, isn't it? Whatever stays in equilibrium, which nothing is really, but that doesn't evolve, that doesn't change really. So keep, keep, keep going at it, changing and, and doing. Thank you so much, Dave. Thank you again. I really appreciate all what you said. Yeah. Thank you. I love the presentation. Thank you. And we have beautiful Michelle. So lovely seeing you. Hello. Hello. Hello from Montana. Hello, um, Montana. Um, Please tell us what you think about Siddhartha. Oh, sorry. Um, I so appreciate the book because to me, I'm not sure he would have gotten to the, the real understanding of love if he didn't have all the, the trivial the vanities and, and, and then the experience of um, blind love of his son. And he would have I'm not sure he would have gotten to the end to experience the unity of what he was trying. His message was for the whole book was we're all, we're all here together and to love one another. But for me, his path or his chosen path of his soul path was going through all these primers to ultimately experience um, the oneness that, We've been the, the, we've been talking about for for a long time and and to actually experience it, but it's almost like he had to experience the rejection um, of his son in order to still see that sense of the unconditional ask well, that what love is. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about? Because I know that you have you have children. How do you feel? about about parenting in this regard that do you feel that some of the things that you have done to your parents or rather not you have done please don't misunderstand me mm -hmm. that it's almost like it could it be recurring unless unless there is a different form of teaching or educational behavior from your part yes i think it was impactful for me is two parts is being a daughter and also a mother because so often i want to to give my children my wisdom or the years of my experience and realizing that they have their own path that their experiences are ultimately going to give them the wisdom that maybe that i've experienced through through you know suffering and joy um and then with my parents, um, and my and my parents are older, and you know, in their 80s, and so I realized how much um, more compassion to have with them in some mm -hmm. of the things that I don't like because <laughs> I'm human, <laughs> and to say, you know, how will my daughter treat me, and what kind of grace will she allow me? So I think it has come full circle for me in both those, mm -hmm. those parts. And isn't it the case because of your experiences, not just the knowledge that you feel differently to your, towards your parents than you did maybe like 20 years ago? Oh, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think there's less judgment. Right. right. And more acceptance that my parents even, you know, I don't think we're ever off the path. Mm -hmm. that we mm -hmm. all at, at 80 or whatever you're still learning or my daughter who's 16 so it's all the it's a continuum i don't think it for me it's it's all a polishing 
and hopefully but from the mistakes we, we learn more and polish a little more but and I guess that's the human element of choice yeah I, I do think that Siddhartha is really it's a it's a beautiful all compass all, all encompassing picture of what most of us really going through that you're born into a family and your parents expect you to do something or lead a life uh, according to their wishes and then you know, if your soul rebels against it then you leave and you and you break those those connections with your parents and you go through all sorts of trials and tribulations and i think that it's it's very universal isn't it in a sense so we all do it in different degrees but we i think we we all do it really yes so, uh, and so the one last thing I'll, I'll say is that i also appreciated the the part of the book about listening mm -hmm. and how important it is and, and makes reference to um you know his friend was absorbing like a tree water his confession and and realizing how powerful that is to just to be completely present with another human being and know that they have this innate not this innate spirit within them that will help them to find the right or, or not the right but a more optimal path for themselves mm -hmm. that i don't necessarily have to there's probably nothing i can really do except for just to be present yeah and also what are, there are amazing scenes and images in the book but one of which i just thought of that towards the end of uh, on this lecture that how um, siddhartha gives a kiss to govinda like when govinda is asking that please give me something that i want to take away with me and then he's not saying any word he just he just kisses kisses his forehead and just that sheer kind of like love towards his friend i think it is just so powerful and it speaks louder than any words i, I really love that i really really love that it was just so so touching thank you for your comments michelle i really appreciate it thank you great to see you great to see you is there anybody else there who would like to share their thoughts and feelings with us Georgie, we have a we have a beautiful question here from Rod, Rick. So Rod says, I am new to Buddhist literature, but has anyone considered the relationship of the Christian biblical account of the prodigal son story? Hmm. I feel like these stories merged could make a beautiful and rich story. Right. Maybe he could make a presentation about that. If if this if this concept arose in him that maybe it is his path he needs to really unfold thank you so much Roderick. thank you maybe he says maybe <laughs> that's a good enough answer for now mm -hmm. wonderful well, is there anybody else um mark would you like to say something i i'm actually uh, this might introduce another issue and it does take us onto a somewhat intellectual plane but jim, jim raises i think a very fundamental question um the the my own sense is that the book book confirms the narrative voice confirms that um siddhartha has reached uh enlightenment and it's 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 there are only three people in the book that really have the, the calm and the, that, um, that the narrative voice attributes to the Buddha. And, and that's the Buddha himself. And uh, uh, Vasudeva, the ferryman. And ultimately, um, Siddhartha. And Siddhartha, Siddhartha communicates that to Govinda through his kiss, as you've as you've noted, and that's um, so. I think that's a, um, a, a the, the view of, a, of of the narrator that we have uh, that Siddhartha has through his own very personal path mm -hmm. reached enlightenment. However it raises up a very difficult question, particularly for, for uh, uh, Westerners uh, looking for social betterment, uh, because it does, it does have that kind of 
of uh, Buddhist understanding that the world is ultimately perfect as it is. And that's something that um, uh, I think, I think uh, many Westerners would find, when others too, would find rather difficult to, to, to incorporate in their own understanding of, of the life around them. So uh, the question would be whether that uh, element of enlightenment really entails uh, that ultimate acceptance of things as they are, as, as Dave observes, or whether um, it leaves us uh, a more enlightened uh, route might be to, to be, um, as, as I think Jim suggests, uh, discontent with uh, certain aspects of samsara. Um, and I'm, I'm not giving an answer to that question. I, I do think that the, uh, the book presents Siddhartha as, as enlightened um, with that understanding, with that ultimate acceptance of things as they are. And that that's our greatest um, accepting things as they are ultimately is our truest understanding of reality. But it's um, it's a challenge. Uh, absolutely. Well, I think for for uh, I would respond uh, yeah, from different aspects. One of which is I think it's not just we Westerners have a problem with it. I think mm -hmm. even even people in the East they have problem with it. Sure. Those who sure. are not fully mm -hmm. in Buddhism or or or, or Hinduism, uh, and and uh, I think that it is hard for us to understand because our conditioned upbringing, because we do not have that faith. That actually, not that Buddhism says that have faith because they do. Uh, he doesn't. He doesn't say that. But uh, uh, with regard to the, your question that when you are enlightened, do you really have that vision of all acceptance? Well, I'm not enlightened, so I can't really answer to that. You have to have that experience. And that's why I can't really speak out of anybody else's experience to that. But um, I, I, I do remind myself on a daily basis that keep saying the mantra to myself that there is divine order. And even if I don't like it, it is what it is. And we don't want to accept it because we, we, we view things from the egoistic point of view or whatever, you know, you, you may say, but I think that's, that's one of the conundrum that we need to, one of the challenge we need to, we need to get to. And just by, by keep doing your practice, whether it is meditation or contemplation or anything else. But I see that Jim Garrison came back and I would love oh, okay. to hear his point of view and probably Dave as well. Mm -hmm. Jim? Yeah, uh, since uh, Mark raised the issue again, I thought I would uh, insert two comments. Um, one is that I think Rod was very um, um, on point to make us think about analogies between the prodigal son and Siddhartha. And I think, Rod, that was behind my question to Georgie at the beginning as to whether the prodigal son gained enlightenment. Because I think with Siddhartha, we have an example of someone uh, who was uh, pr uh, prodigal. He was promiscuous. And it wasn't clear to me in reading the book that he ever um, got to the end of the road. And I think the, another way of asking the question, uh, Georgie and Mark, uh, is whether he had finished his lifetimes. The, in the classic Buddhist notion of enlightenment, like Milarepa in Tibet, he gained enlightenment in one lifetime. The Buddha came to the end of the road. The, 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 the flame went out because he had learned and experienced all there was. If I had to project and guess, I would, have, I would say that Siddhartha wasn't at the end of his road. Mm -hmm. um, and that he, he still at the end of the book had many issues that were, were still unresolved. And like the prodigal son, 
uh, it's one thing to accept the totality of being. It's another thing to wake up. And I think that's a different phenomenon, uh, which leads me to the, 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 just that second um, observation. Um, I would say, Mark, that as I read the story, uh, the Buddha uh, was clearly in a class all by himself. And the, the, the interaction between the Buddha and Siddhartha was similar to, the, to Jesus and the rich man, where the, the rich man says, what do I have to do to gain eternal, the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus said, go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And the rich man knew he was right, but went away sorrowfully because he could not do it. Uh, and so I, I think there's, there's uh, uh, as, uh, and the point I would, would leave us with is, is like with all great authors, I mean, Shakespeare, um, and Rumi, um, any of the great, um, uh, the greatest of the greatest authors ultimately work their genius within the context of ambiguity. Oh, yeah, sure. so the fact that at the end of the book, we, we, would, we would wrestle with this question, was he really enlightened, is the genius of Hesse. <laughs> uh, no, absolutely. May, yeah. I, may, I, may I make some reinforcement here of, of, uh, of my position, Jim, and we're continuing. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm on uh, reading, uh, Siddhartha says this. He says, um, I, in my body and in my soul, I realized that I greatly needed sin, I needed lust, vanity, the striving for goods, and I needed the most shameful despair to learn how to give up resistance, to learn how to, world, uh, to love the world. I learned how to let the, let the world be as it is. And then, but what he's discovered out of that is um, love. He mm -hmm. says, uh, love, O Govinda, seems paramount to me. Seeing the world, explaining it, despising it may be crucial to great thinkers, but all I care about is to be able to love the world. That's his great insight at the end. And what does that leave him with? Well, in Govinda's, uh, in, in Govinda's uh, perception, it leaves him with this. Govinda says, Never since our sublime Gautama entered Nirvana, never have I met another man about whom I felt this is a saint. I have felt this way only about him, this Siddhartha. His teaching may be strange, his words may sound foolish, but his eyes, his hands, his skin, his hair, everything about him radiates a purity, radiates a peace, radiates a mildness and serenity and saintliness, which I have seen in no other person since the final death of our sublime teacher. So that's why I would say that, that um, he does reach it, at least as it's understood in the book, and its supreme element is love. And in order to get that love, we need to have samsara in the world. We need to have the rough spots um, because it's only through them that we ultimately reach that degree of compassion and love. Thank you, Mark. I would like to say two, two brief comments and I would like to invite Dave for his comments. Uh, Jim, thank you very much for, for sharing your opinion with us again. I would say uh, first that uh, everything is a subjective interpretation, isn't it? So uh, that's why there are book clubs. <laughs> like people have actually a different opinion about, about it. But no, I think this is what's happened. No, I think that's, that's happened. So it, that's what Hermann Hesse said that I pointed out in my first lecture, that that's the magic about a, a book, that the realm you enter into is so subjective according to your own experience and how you feel. And the, the other comment I would like to make that we know that Hermann Hesse wrote himself in, in Siddhartha. So maybe that's what Jim fears that because probably Herman Hesse didn't reach that aspired enlightenment, that's what Jim picks upon, 
but his wishful thinking was definitely that Siddhartha reached enlightenment. That's what he really wanted. So in a, in a sense, this is all about Herman Hesse's voice. And of course, the voice and the messages of the universe through Herman Hesse. Dave, what do you think? Uh, I, I love the discussion. Uh, you know, just just delightful. Particularly Jim's comment about the the ambiguity introduced by great literature. Um, the the main point that I would pick up is on Merck's identification of acceptance. That I have always uh, thought of acceptance as that of living the Serenity Prayer. That. I, and also the, the gestalt concept of the paradoxical theory of change. That in order to in, introduce change, one needs to accept what is. And from there, one can move forward in one's own life. That the serenity prayer, you know, as commonly stated, is the serenity to accept what is, the courage to change what I, uh, what I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And for me, that stands out in the, the stance of um, high intention, low. Um, oh damn! <laughs> low something. <laughs> yeah, you got you, Dave. yeah. yeah I'm sure, I, I imagine you've got me. Anyway, that would be my comment. That acceptance does not mean the resignation that I have to, you know, just passively accept what is, but that I can be active in my own life in dealing with my own need to grow through that, through that process. Thank you. I, I agree with that. I think that with acceptance, I think change could be easier. Uh, I don't think that that is just my acceptance, whether that is or that isn't really is the point. Because if I was thinking that way, that would be a very selfish point of view. And I would, I would detach myself from there is a universal law or maybe a universal path already laid, laid out for, not in terms of determination. So I would say that if I don't accept that is, and on there is change, change will still happen. Yeah, if I don't accept uh, change itself, then it may be forced upon me in a way that I don't like it. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And can one simply uh, be joyous mm. is what life offers? Mm. Jim, is there anything you would like to add? Well, I was just uh, leaning forward because I know we're coming to the end of our time and I wanted to Make sure, Rod, that you uh, got my little chat about putting your poem up on our Facebook page. <laughs> and I uh, wanted to make sure all the students and anybody, in fact, uh, joins our Facebook discussion um, uh, because I think this, this uh, lecture of Georgie's was, was uh, very, very uh, deep and insightful. And really, as we've been wrestling uh, with it really comes to a, a, a sharp point of what, what, is it, what does it mean to learn from life? Mm. And how do we learn from life? And what is the role of samsara and suffering and uh, being a prodigal son or daughter in the pathway of acceptance? And um, so I want to... Uh, make sure that everybody um, uh, you know wrestles with these kinds of issues and, and and these these thoughts and we discuss them on our our Facebook page um, and then to uh, also to say that next uh, month I'll be back with uh, Machiavelli uh, and the Prince and in some ways uh, Machiavelli uh, is the polar opposite to the Buddha and the prince uh, is in a completely different realm than Siddhartha. <laughs> so uh, as, you, as you reflect on the river and the eternity of being and the acceptance of all things in the spirit of love and compassion, next month we're gonna go to our opposite and really wrestle as Machiavelli did with what does it mean within the context of samsara 
to exercise power. So that's what we're going to contemplate for the From next time. Uh, to the hilt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's samsara to the hilt. <laughs> And we like to structure our great books in a way that eases out these polarities. Both and, sides uh, of the river, right? <laughs> both sides of the river. Yeah. <laughs> but Georgie, your lectures on Siddhartha were sublime. Thank uh, you. Both of them. And so thank you so much. And, and they were very, very deep and open up a uh, very wide discourse and um, appreciation for both words and the truths that lie beyond words. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you for joining. It was wonderful. Mark, Dave, Roderick, Michelle, Mira, everybody. See you soon again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, gang. <laughs>